So this is chapter 9, talking about the joints of the body. Um, so a joint is also called an articulation or an arthrosis, and this is going to be a point of contact between a couple of different things. Um, it can be a contact between two or more bones, um, between cartilage and bones, and then also between teeth and bones. Um, so there's a couple different options there, um, but all of which are considered to be a joint. As with everything, we like to classify joints. Um, we can classify them based on their structure or their functionality. So structurally, um, what we look for when we are talking about classifying joints is, um, is there a joint cavity, or also called a synovial cavity, and then what kind of connective tissue um, is involved in the structure. And then additionally, structurally, uh, Excuse me. So structurally, joints are classified as either fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial. Functionally, we look at the degree of movement that's permitted by the joint. So functionally, joints are classified as either a synarthrosis, which is immovable, amphiarthroses, uh, which are partially movable, and diarthroses, which are fairly movable. <coughs> so... Um, Again, we can break those uh, classifications down even further. Um, within fibrous joints, there are a couple of different groups. Um, we have sutures. These are going to be dense fibrous connective tissues. Um, so this would be things like the sutures that make up um, the, the that connect the bones of the skull. Uh, then we have syndesmoses. Um, these are more. These have more dense fibrous connective tissue um, than what you would fi find in a suture. Um, so an example of this would be a gymphosis, which is what kind of holds your teeth um, in your head. And then uh, we also have interosseous membranes um, as a potential fibrous uh, joint. Um, and this is just basically going to be a broad sheet of dense fibrous connective tissue. Um, so these are going to be the connective tissues that are found between the radius and the ulna or and the tibia and the fibula. Um, so there's you know, different kinds there. The next type of structural classification we have are the cartilaginous joints. Um, we have our synchondroses. These are going to have hyaline cartilage, and they're not going to allow for any movement. Um, epiphyseal plates are an example of synchondroses, and these don't, like I said, allow for any kind of movement of that joint. And then we also have a symphysis. Um, this is made up of a fibrocartilage, um, and it does allow for some movement. Um, this is things like the pubic symphysis. Um, the the little bit of um, fibrocartilage that's between those two pelvic bones. Uh, this is going to allow for some movement, especially um, during pregnancy and childbirth, so that the, um, the hips can shift and widen to allow for baby to be born more slightly more easily. And then our last structural classification of joints is our synovial joints. Um, these are going to have uh, articular cartilage on one end of the of a long bone, and then a synovial cavity that's between the articulating bones that's going to be surrounded by various accessory, accessory ligaments that are going to be there to kind of help hold it in place, um, as well as allow for movement. Um, and these are freely movable joints. So these are the big obvious joints that you think about. These are like your hips, your knees, your shoulders, your elbows. These are the big, the big movable joints that are the really obvious ones when we talk about joints. And then functionally, again, when we classify our joints, we have uh, the synarthroses. These are not going to allow any movements. So in things like sutures and gymphoses, those are going to be synarthroses. Um, amphiarthroses are going to allow for just a little bit of movement. Um, and again, these are the, pel the pubic symphysis um, as well as the intervertebral discs. They allow for just a little bit of movement or wiggle. And then we have our diarthroses. Again, those are freely movable. Um, those are the things like the hips, the knees, the shoulders, the elbows. A lot of these are going to be um, uh, the uh, the excuse me. The a lot of these are going to be the synovial type joints. Okay, so let's then look at some examples, or a little bit more in depth, um, for each of these different kinds of joints. So fibrous joints. These are going to lack synovial cavities. Um, they're going to have articulating bones that are going to be held together uh, with dense fibrous connective tissue, and they're going to allow for very little movement, so it's little to no movement. Um, these include sutures, uh, syndesmoses, as well as interosseous membranes. Right. So, for some examples, when we talk about sutures, these are, and you can see these are the 
basically the sutures or the, the joints that are going to um, join the bones of the skull. These, um, this is going to have a this is going to be a fibrous joint that's composed of a thin layer of dense fibrous connective tissue that's going to unite the bones of the skull. So in older individuals, sutures are going to be immovable. They're synarthroses. Uh, but in infants uh, and little children, they are going to be slightly movable. So they're ambiarthroses. This allows for a baby's head to kind of change shape slightly, especially during uh, the whole birthing process. This is why sometimes babies will be born and they have that kind of crazy cone head shape. It's because these, uh, these sutures, these fibrous joints, these sutures, are, um, are synarthroses. Right? The next example of a fibrous joint that we have is, in a, is a synesthosis. Um, and this is a suture joint that has basically ossified, it's turned to bone. So an example of a synesthosis would be the frontal bone suture uh, between the left and the right sides of the frontal bone. So initially, when you're little, um, the frontal bone is made of, of two, two separate bones, and then as you age, um, that, uh, that, that connective tissue um, is, gonna, is going to turn to bone, essentially. So a synesthosis is functionally going to be classified as a synarthrosis uh, because it is, a, it is an immovable joint. Another example of a fibrous joint would be a syndesmosis. Um, this is a fibrous joint in which there are there's going to be more fibrous connective tissue <clears throat> than what you would see in, in a uh, in a suture. So a gumphosis is going to be a fibrous uh, syndesmosis joint um, in which the a cone shaped peg like a tooth is going to fit into a socket. So you can see that here. So a gumphosis, um, the the tooth fitting into a socket there. Uh, is an excellent example of a gymphosis. Um, and then another example of a syndesmosis is going to be uh, the distal tibiofibular ligament, um, and this is going to permit some movement. So you can see here this is this thick layer of um, <clears throat> this thick layer of, of connective tissue here. And that does allow for some movement to occur. Um, and then our last type of fib or last example of fibrous joints would be the interosseous membrane. So this is that this is going to be a fibrous joint that's made up of this really broad sheet um, of ligament uh, that's going to allow for some movement between adjacent bones. Um, this is also going to make a really great attachment point for the muscles of the arm or the leg. So between the radius and the ulna, we're going to have this interosseous membrane here um, or interosseous ligament. Um, that serves as that fibrous joint there. All right. Our next type of joint is a cartilaginous joint. Like I said, these guys lack synovial cavities. Um, they are going to be arti the articulating bones are going to be held together with cartilage connective tissue, and they're going to permit little to no movement. So they're fairly they're fairly fixed. So various types of cartilaginous joints are uh, synchondroses, symphysis, symphyses, um, and then the epiphyseal cartilage there. So. Um, a synchondrosis is going to be um, a cartilaginous joint in which the connecting material is going to be hyaline cartilage and it is going to be slightly movable um, to immovable so it's going to vary in how much movement is allowed so it can be anything from an amphiarthrotic or amphiarthrosis um, to a synarthrosis all right and so a great example of this synchondrosis is going to be the joint between that first rib up here um, and then the manubrium of the sternum so this is going to have hyaline cartilage in the middle, and it's forming that synchondrosis, that joint, that cartilaginous joint. Um, our next kind of cartilaginous joint is a symphysis. Um, so this here we're seeing the pelvic symphysis. All right, so this is a cartilaginous joint in which the ends of the articulating bones are going to be covered again in hyaline cartilage, but it's going to be a broad, flat disc of fibrous of, of, excuse me, of fibrocartilage that are going to actually connect those two bones. So this little disc here in the middle made up of fibrocartilage. Um, so all symphyses are going to occur along the midline. Uh, you're not going to have any on the, on the, out on the edges there. So in the pubic symphysis and the, the joints that are, the joints that make up the part of the vertebral column, um, all of these are going to be, uh, all of these synarthroses, excuse me, all of these symphyses are going to be um, along the midline. Uh, so the pubic symphysis is between the anterior surface of the hip bones. This is a really great example of a symphysis. 
So this type of joint is going to be found at the junction of the manubrium and the body of the sternum as well, and then also at the intervertebral, intervertebral joints uh, between the bodies of those vertebrae. So all of these are found along the midline. And then a symphysis is going to be a slightly movable joint, so they are amphiarthrotic or amphiarthroses. Um, and like I said, they do allow for some movement, especially at this pubic symphysis, especially during pregnancy and childbirth. Um, it's allowing for that widening of that hip to occur so that baby can fit through the, the pelvic opening there. Right. Next type of cartilaginous joint that we have is the epiphyseal cartilage. So we've talked about the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate um, and how this eventually will turn into an epiphyseal line. So uh, for the epiphyseal cartilage, this is an epiphyseal um, this is going to be uh, made up of hyaline cartilage that's going to be localized um, in growth centers during endochondrial bone formation. And then functionally, um, epiphyseal cartilage is going to be an immovable joint, so it's a synarthrosis. And then when the bone elongation is done, is complete, you're as tall as you're going to get, that, um, that hyaline cartilage is going to be replaced by bone. Um, and this, then it's going to, that uh, epiphyseal cartilage will become a synesthosis or a bony joint. Um, our next type of joint then is our synovial joints. These are the really big, obvious joints that we think about when we think about when somebody says a, a joint in your body. Um, so these are going to have a synovial ca cavity, and we'll talk about what that is a little bit more in just a minute. Um, so the articulating bones are going to be covered with articular cartilage, um, and they're going to be held together by ligaments. And this uh, is this joint is also going to contain synovial cavity, and it's going to have a blood and nerve supply, and are going to be surrounded by an articular capsule. And these types of joints, these synovial joints, are going to permit a large range of motion. And we have a bunch of different kinds of those, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So there are some just general structures of a synovial joint that we need to cover first. Um, so one of the unique characteristics of these synovial joints is going to be the presence of a space called the synovial cavity. All right, so you can see that here. This is going to be in between these two, these two joints. It's in between these two bones here that are articulating our synovial cavity. Um, this is also called a joint cavity, and it's between, like I said, it's found between those two articulating bones. So because the synovial cavity is going to allow for a considerable amount of movement at the joint, um, all synovial cavities are going to be classified functionally as freely movable, so they're diarthroses. Right, and then the bones of, excuse me, the bones at a synovial joint are going to be covered in a thin layer of hyaline cartilage, which is called articular cartilage. So the cartilage um, is going to cover the articulating surface of the bones um, with a smooth kind of slippery surface that's there to sort of help reduce friction um, as so those two bones don't rub together, you know, bone on bone kind of thing. That would be unpleasant. And it's also going to help to um, reduce, uh, to absorb shock. So um, just for a few more of the general structures of the synovial joint, a major uh, characteristic of a synovial joint is going to be the articular capsule. Um, and so this is going to surround a diarthrosis and it's going to be enclosed, it's going to enclose the synovial cavity and unite those two articulating bones. Um, so the articular capsule is going to be composed of two layers. We have our outer fibrous capsule and this is, um, and this can sometimes contain ligaments. And then we have the inner synovial membrane. And this is going to be, this synovial membrane is responsible for secreting um, the lubricating and joint nourishing synovial fluid. It's going to kind of keep everything lubricated and neat and tidy. So the flexibility of that fibrous uh, capsule is going to permit, um, is going to allow for a pretty large range of movement. And, um, but that great tensile strength that it has is also going to help to prevent those bones from dislocating. So it allows for a great range of movement, but only within reason, um, so that, that bone, that bone, excuse me, so that those bones don't slide out of, out of place. So other capsular features are going to include the ligaments and the articular fat pads um, that are gonna be surrounded, that are gonna kinda hold everything in place and provide cushion. And then, just sort of an interesting little fun fact, a person who is considered to be double jointed doesn't actually have any extra joints. Um, this is just basically an individual uh, who has a greater amount of flexibility in the articular capsules and ligaments surrounding a joint. Um, so it allows for a greater range of movement than what one would normally see um, in a normal person who's not double jointed. 
So um, that brings us into our synovial fluid. This is an important sort of secretion that's secreted by the synovial membrane. Um, it's going to be kind of a viscous sort of clear to pale yellow fluid. Um, and this is named because it's um, because of its appearance and consistency. It looks kind of like consistency wise, it looks a bit like an uncooked egg white. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of sticky and, and viscous and doesn't flow very well, uh, kind of gooey. Um, so these, the synovial fluid is going to consist of hyaluronic acid, which is going to be secreted by the synovial cells in the synovial membrane, as well as interstitial fluid that's filtered in from the blood plasma. So this is going. This this fluid is formed by is going to form a uh, thin film over the surface with the various surfaces within that articular capsule, and it's going to function um, in reducing friction by lubricating the joint. It's also going to be involved in absorbing shock, as well as supplying oxygen and nutrients and removing any kind of waste or carbon dioxide um, from those chondrocytes within that articular cartilage. So. Um, there are also going to be certain phagocytic cells that are going to help to remove uh, any kind of microbes or debris uh, that are going to result from just normal wear and tear on the joint. So that's there to kind of keep everything neat and tidy. So um, a few other things that are common accessories for synovial joints um, are ex the various accessory ligaments in the articular discs. Um, so many of these uh, diarthroses are also going to contain um, accessory ligaments and articular discs. And these articular discs are sometimes called menisci or meniscus for singular. Um, uh, so ligaments are going to help to hold bone to bone and the articular discs are going to modify that shape of that joint, um, of that joint surface of the articulating bones. And these are going to help to maintain the stability of the joint as well as direct the flow of synovial fluid to the areas that are going to experience the greatest friction. Right. We then have something called a labrum, and this is going to be found most commonly in ball and socket type joints. Um, and this is a fibrocartilaginous uh, lip that's going to extend from the edge of the joint socket, so the, the, the rounded kind of cup that, that that ball is going to fit into. Um, these are going to help to deepen that joint socket as well as increase the area of contact that the socket and the ball and the ball like surface of the head of things like the femur or the humerus are going to have. So this is just increasing the surface area of that um, socket part of that joint so that there's more contact area um, for the head of that or the ball of, or the head to actually fit into that socket. All right. So many diarthroses are also going to contain, excuse me, I already said that, that's redundant. Um, oh, excuse me. So uh, this is a weird slide, I apologize. So here, let's see, here we can see the labrum. This is a nice example of this. Um, this is a between the, uh, the scapula and the, um, the humerus. Um, and here you can see this, this, um, this fibrocartilaginous lip that's extending from the edge of the, um, the humerus. Um, it's called, this is that labrum there that's just increasing the surface area so that there's a deeper socket for that, um, for the head of that humerus to fit into. Uh, so nerve and bone supply and blood supply um, are pretty simple. We're not going to get too much into that. So the um, the nerves that supply a joint are going to be the same things that the supply this the same joint. Excuse me. <laughs> the nerves that supply a joint are going to be the same nerves that supply uh, the skeletal muscles that are responsible for moving that joint. And then synovial joints are also going to contain many nerve endings. Um, that are going to be distributed ac distributed across that articular capsule and the associated ligaments. This is going to be one of the reasons that it hurts uh, if you ever dislocate or sublux um, a joint uh, is because of those nerve those nerve endings there. And then there are going to be an assortment of various uh, arteries and veins that are going to supply the joints and the surrounding structures just to make sure everything is well vascularized and um, to bring in any kind of nutrients and oxygen and remove. Uh, CO2 and any sort of metabolic waste from, from the joint, the cells in that joint. Um, so another common um, characteristic or thing that's found in synovial joints are bursas and uh, tendon sheaths. Right? So a bursa and a tendon sheet can be found in uh, many different synovial joints. So a bursa is just going to be a kind of like a sac-like structure that's filled with synovial fluid um, that's going to cushion movement of one part of the body as it moves across another part. 
Um, so here we can see our bursa between um, our humerus and our, it looks like our, our scapula there. All right, so this is just kind of basically a little sac-like cushion um, f for, the, for that joint there. And then a tendon sheath is going to be a tube-like bursa. So the only really main difference is that this is um, a different shape. It's tube-shaped. It's going to wrap around tendons that are subject to a great deal of friction. So this is, again, going to help to just reduce the friction that's being experienced in that joint. So um, we also have, like I said, we've got lots and lots of different types of synovial joints. Um, and they all move in different ways. And these are going to be actually very important for the exam. Um, so do be sure to, to know them. So. Um, we have, first, we have a plane joints or plantar joints. These are going to permit mainly like a side-to-side -side or back-and-forth sort of gliding movement. Um, these joints are going to be non-axial and are going to include things like the intercarpal joints, uh, the intertarsal joints, the sternoclavicular, um, the chromioclavicular, um, sternocostal, and verte uh, vertebrocostal joints. Um, so here in figure A, we can see an example of these plantar joints, all right? So they've got that biaxial movement. They do a lot of sliding and gliding, all right? Next, we have our hinge joint, which you can see down here. This is going to contain a, um, a convex surface of one bone that's going to fit into a concave surface of, another, of the other bone. And so movement of this kind of joint is primarily going to be flexion and extension, along a single plane. And this is going to include things, joints like the elbows, the knees, the ankles, as well as the interphalangeal joints. So you're not going to have any kind of back and forth wiggling. It's just going to be um, a, a, just going to be flexion and extension. All right. And then our, our third type of synovial joint, which we see over here, is a pivot joint. And this is going to have a round or a pointed surface of one bone, um, like we see here in the head of the radius. It's going to fit um, into a ring that's going to be formed by either another bone or a ligament. All right, so here we have our articular ligament that's going to form to help form that joint between um, the radius and the ulna. Um, so movement of this is going to be rotational and monoaxial. All right, so we can see what that looks like here. And then, like I said, a great example um, is going to be the atlas, like on the um, that first uh, that first. Um, that first vertebra in this of the vertebral column, so the atlas rotating on its axis is a really great example of a um, of a pivot joint. All right, our next kind of synovial joint is a condyloid joint. All right, these this is going to be an oval shaped uh, condyle of one bone that's going to fit into an um, elliptical cavity of another bone. So here you can see a great example of that. All right, so movement of these. Of these types of joints are going to be flexion and extension as well as abduction, adduction, and circumduction. So examples of these are going to be the carpals and the radius. Um, they're going to be between the carpals and the radius. And we'll talk more about what these movements uh, mean in a little bit uh, with the abduction and adduction stuff. So we'll get there. Um, our next kind of joint is a saddle joint, um, which we can see here is, a, you know, joints right here. Um, and these are going to contain one bone whose articular cartilage, or excuse me, articular surface is going to be kind of like a saddle shaped, um, have a saddle shape to it. And another bone whose articular surface is going to be shaped like the rider that's sitting on that saddle. So here we have our saddle shape and our little guy that's going to be riding on that saddle. All right. Um, so a great example of a saddle joint is going to be between the trapezium of the carpus and in the wrist and then the metacarpal um, of the thumb, right? So that thumb joint kind of lower, farther back in your hand, close to your wrist. Um, so movements of these are going to include um, flexion and extension, um, abduction, adduction, and circumduction, all right? So then our final type of um, movement for a synovial joint um, is going to be a ball and socket joint. And this is, a, this is, I guess, probably what's most commonly thought of when people think about joints. Um, this is going to be like the ball and socket, the ball or the head of the femur fitting into the acetabulum of that hip bone there. All right. So this is going to have a ball-shaped surface of one bone that fits into a cup-like kind of depression of, of the other bone. So that acetabulum or that, the head of that humerus, or excuse me, the head of that femur, uh, fitting into the acetabulum of the hip. So movements 
for this type of joint are going to include flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction, as well as rotation and circumduction. And the only example, two examples of this type of joint are going to be the shoulder joint and the hip joint. All right. So here for your studying delights, and you can you know blow this up on your own, and make it larger. Um, this is going to be just a nice little table of the various types um, and classifications of the various types of joints um, and how they're classified. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go through and talk about the types of movements that um, can be accomplished by these synovial joints, by the various kinds of synovial joints. So the first movement we have is it's called gliding, and this is going to occur when uh, relatively flat bones are going to slide um, or move back and forth um, or from one side or the other um, or from side to side with respect to um, one another. All right? uh, so in a gliding joint there's going to be no significant alteration at the angle of those bones. Um, so we're not really, you know, there's not a whole lot of bending. It's just, it's more sliding and gliding as the name would imply. Um, so uh, this gliding movement is going to occur in plantar joints and the intertar intercarpals and intertarsal joints are um, examples of articulations where gliding movements are going to occur. All right, next we have um, angular movements and these are going to be important. Um, so you should, you definitely need to know these for the exam. Um, so first we have um, an angular, excuse me, in angular movements, there's going to be an increase or a decrease in the angle between the articulating bones here. All right, so here we've seen our, our change in our angle. We can see that there. Um, and so the principal um, angular movements are going to be flexion, extension, and hyperextension. All right, uh, so flexion is going to result in a decrease in the angle of the articulating bones, right? So here we can see flexion. Wait, there we go flexion of the elbow, all right, we're decreasing that angle, all right, we're bringing it up, bringing that arm up towards the body, um, it's, uh, it's decreasing the angle, this is flexion, all right, uh, and then on the other end of that we have extension, and this is going to result in an increase um, in the angle between those articulating bones, right, so here we have ex flexion where we bring, we decrease the angle, and then extension where we increase the angle of that joint, all right. Lateral flexion is another movement that's um, another one of the angular movements that's done. Um, this is going to involve movement of the trunk um, in a sideways um, to the left or right at the waist. So this movement is going to occur in the frontal plane and is going to involve those intervertebral joints. So here we see our, our friend, um, this little guy, um, doing some lateral flexion. Right? So if you've ever heard the song, I'm a Little Teapot, um, if you know the dance that goes with that, this is... Um, a great example, um, a great way to illustrate lateral flexion, um, where you're bending at the side there. You're keeping your body straight, but bending to the left or the right at the waist. Um, and then we have hyperextension, and this is going to be a continuation of extension, but it's going to go beyond the anatomical position, um, and is usually going to be prevented by um, the arrangement of ligaments um, and the anatomical alignment of bones. Uh, sometimes these, this hyperextension um, is perfectly normal. Um, you know, we can, if you tilt your head back and look up at the ceiling, that's an example of hyperextension of the neck. That's perfectly normal. We also see down here we have hyperextension of the leg, where this guy is, I assume it's a, this, this person is kicking their leg straight backwards, um, past or beyond uh, the rein, beyond the anatomical position. Um, this is a hyperextension. So that's perfectly normal. Um, when you get into trouble, it was like when you hyperextend things that are not supposed to hyperextend, like your knees and your elbows, etc. Um, things that are not supposed to hyperextend are ideally going to have ligaments and bone structure that's there to kind of prevent that from happening. So um, hyperextension can lead to some pathological events um, that are really problematic, but it can also be just completely normal here, like what we see with like looking up at the ceiling. Um, is hyperextension of the neck. So that's perfectly normal. So, um, all right. Next, we have some more angular movements. We have abduction with a B and adduction with a D, right? And these are going to sound very similar. So it's important to remember which is which and to kind of get them straight in your head. So 
abduction with a B. So ab means away, um, and then duct means to lead. So to lead away, um, so abduction, like we say, is going to be the radial deviation, um, excuse me, so abduction is also called radial deviation, and is going to be the movement of a bone away from the midline, all right? So if we were to abduct our arm, we'd hold it out to the side. We'd be moving our arm away from the midline. We're abducting it, all right? And then if you were to adduct it with a D, adduct, right, um, with the D, that ad means towards, right? This is also called ulnar deviation in this particular example. Um, and this is going to be the movement of a bone towards the midline, all right? So we're bringing our arm back to, to the side. We're bringing it closer towards the midline, all right? So both movements are usually going to occur along the frontal plane, all right? So an example of abduction is going to include moving the humerus laterally at the shoulder joint, all right, moving, holding your arm out straight like that, as well as moving the palm laterally at the wrist joint, all right, so moving laterally at the wrist joint would be an example of uh, abduction, and then moving the femur laterally at the hip, all right, so here we've got abduction of the leg there, all right. Um, then the movements that return each of these body position or each of these body parts to the anatomical position are going to be adduction. All right, so bringing it back down, bringing your leg back down, bringing your arm back down to your side, bringing them towards the midline. This is adduction. All right, so it is important to mention that the fingers, the fingers are a little bit different. They don't quite follow the same rule. Um, well, they sort of do. So, the midline of the body is not going to be of the the midline of the actual of, of your body is not going to be used as a point of reference for abduction and adduction of the digits. Instead, we're using the midline of the hand to gauge abduction and adduction. So, in abduction with a B, abduction of the fingers, um, but not the thumb. That's different. We're going to draw an imaginary line um, through the longitudinal axis or the, of the middle or the longest finger. Um, and the fingers are going to move away or spread out from that middle finger. All right, so spreading your fingers apart like this, moving them away from the midline, if you will, of the hand. Um, this is abduction of the phalanges of the fingers. All right, and then adduction, again, is bringing them back together. So uh, in abduction of the thumb, the thumb is going to move away from the palm uh, in a sagittal plane. All right, so the thumb is, does its own weird thing but it, it just moves um, away from, uh, it just moves away from the palm, right? So, next, for more of our angular movements, um, we have something called circumduction. Um, circa, like circle, um, is going to be the movement of the distal end of a body part in a circle. So swinging your arms around in a circle, um, or swinging your legs around, this is circumduction. This is gonna occur, this whole movement is a result um, of a continuous sequence of flexion, abduction, extension, and adduction. All of these things are going to combine to give you this circular movement called circumduction. All right, so a couple of different types of joints um, are going to allow for circumduction. All right, um, specifically our condyloid, our saddle, and our ball sockets are all, or our ball and socket joints are all going to allow for circumduction. Um, this does not usually occur um, along a separate axis or a plane of movement, though. Um, and so, uh, examples of, just a couple examples of circumduction are going to be the movement of the humerus in a circle in the shoulder joint, um, movements of the hand in a circle at the wrist joint, moving the thumb in a circle at that carpal, metacarpal joint, um, moving the femur in a circle at the hip joint. Um, all of these are examples of circumduction, all right? So, now, we need to talk about some rotational terms, all right? some rotational movements that can occur. So in rotation, a bone is going to revolve around its own longitudinal axis, all right? So here we've got our longitudinal axis and it's revolving around that, um, that axis. So both pivot and ball and socket joints are going to allow for rotation to occur. And if the anterior surface of a bone is turned towards the midline, um, we've got medial rotation, all right? So we've got our anterior surface of the of, the, the of the forearm here, turning towards the midline. So you're bringing your forearm across your body, your torso. This is medial rotation, 
right? On the other hand, lateral rotation is going to occur if the anterior surface of a bone of whatever limb we're talking about is turned away from the midline. So here our friend here has turned her, um, turned her forearm out and away from that midline, all right? That's lateral rotation, all right? So medial is coming towards the midline, toward, uh, and then lateral is away from the midline. We can see the same thing, um, that you can do the same kind of rotations with the, with the leg, here with our lateral and our medial rotation. Right. You can also see it really nicely in our head. Um, this is just a general example of, um, of rotation. Uh, shaking your head, no, is just rotation. Right. So, next, we have some special movements. All right. So first we have elevation. Uh, this is going to be um, an upward movement of a body part. So here we've got our friend. She's got her, her mouth closed. This is an upward movement of the mandible. Um, her jaw, or the mandible, is elevated. On the other side of that, we have depression. Um, so this is a downward movement of a body part. So when you're, her mouth's hanging open in shock and surprise, um, this is a depression of the mandible. All right? Protraction is going to be the movement of a body part um, uh, of a, um, that's going to move anteriorly um, in the transverse plane. All right? So here we've got our friend sticking out his jaw in a big, like, a big underbite kind of looking uh, kind of underbite looking face. It's a goofy looking face, but it looks like an underbite. Um, this is a protraction of the mandible. And then retraction of the mandible is going to be um, a movement of a protracted part of the body back to its anatomical position. Um, so he's just brought his mouth back to normal resting point. All right? um, next for our special movements we have um, inversion and eversion. All right, so inversion is going to be the movement of the sole of, a, of the foot um, medially in an, at the intertarsal joints so that they face away from each other. If you've ever rolled your ankle, um, chances are this is how you did it. You inverted. You, you had some inversion going on. All right, this hurts, but you recover. If you ever roll it the other way, if you ever have inversion occur, you're in for a world of hurt. This hurts a lot more for some reason. Uh, so inversion is going to be a movement of the sole that's lateral, they're going to move laterally at the intertarsal joint so that, the, so that they are going to face away from each other. Um, so, yeah, so uh, e this is eversion. And then we have dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, all right? These are just fancy words for saying flex and point your feet or your toes. Um, so dorsiflexion is going to be the flexing of your foot um, or your toes. Uh, this is going to refer to bending the foot at the ankle in, a, in the direction of a superior surface. All right? So here we've got our flexed foot, our dorsiflexion. And then opposite to that is our plantar flexion. We've got our pointed toes like a ballerina here. Um, this is going to involve bending the foot at the ankle joint in the direction of the plantar surface. All right? So flexing and pointing our toes, the fancy way to say that or the anatomically correct way to say that would be to dorsiflex and plantar flex, okay? And then last but not least, we have just a couple more of these special movements. Uh, we have supination and pronation, all right? So supination, uh, this is usually, well, this can be anything, but this is, we're going to talk about the hands or that radio ulnar joint. So supination is a movement of the forearm at the proximal and distal radial ulnar joint in which the palms are going to be turned anteriorly or superiorly, right? So your hand is, your palm is facing upwards. Um, I always kind of remember it like supination, like soup, like your cup in your hand to hold some soup in your hand. So supination is your palm is facing upwards, right? Um, and then the opposite of that, if you were to flip your hand over, would be pronation. And this is a movement of the forearm at that proximal and distal radial ulnar joint um, in which the distal end of the radius um, is going to cross over the distal end of the ulna and the palm is going to be turned posteriorly or inferiorly. So hand, palm facing down posteriorly. Um, it's prone, this is going to be pronation. All right? So soup, you're holding your soup in your hand uh, for supination, palm up. And then pronation is hand is palm down. Then we have this other last one. It's kind of just a goofy one. This is called opposition. Um, and this is going to be the movement of the thumb at the carpometacarpal joint in which the thumb is going to move across the palm to touch the tip of the fingers on that same hand here. So we've got, this is an example of opposition. You can touch any of those fingers on, touching your thumb to any of those fingers is going to be opposition. All right. Um, so 
all of this is summed up into a handy dandy little table for your studying delights um, and then just a few more things and then we'll wrap this up um, so there are a couple of different factors that are going to impact uh, the contact and the range of motion at a synovial joint and these are some important things to consider when we talk about joints so the articular surface of a synovial joint is going to contact one another and is, this is going to be what's to, going to determine the type and the possible range of motion that a joint can achieve. All right, so range of motion is going to refer to the range or which is going to be measured in degrees of a circle through which the bones of a joint are able to move. All right, so we talk about range of motion. If you have full range of motion in your neck, you can, you know, move it in a full round circle. Um, so there are going to be several factors that are going to impact um, this contact and range of motion for our synovial joints. All right. So the first is going to be the structure or the shape of those articulating bones. Um, so the structure or shape of those articulating bones is going to determine how closely they are able to fit together. And the articular surface of some bones is going to have a kind of complementary relationship. This is like an interlocking fit that's going to allow for um, rotational movement to occur. Uh, the next uh, factor that impacts the uh, contact and range of motion is going to be the strength and tension or tautness um, of the ligaments in a joint. Um, so uh, the different components of a, fibro of a fibrous capsule are going to be tend are going to be either tense or taut only when the joint is in a certain position. So tense ligaments are not only going to restrict the range of motion, but they're also going to help to direct the motion of the articulating bones with respect to each other. Um, they're going to help to kind of keep things moving in the correct direction. Essentially, so this is going to help to keep things from going, getting bent out of shape. Essentially. Um, next, we have the arrangement and tension. Of the muscles. This is going to be uh, the fact that muscle tension is going to reinforce uh, the restraint that's placed on a joint by its ligaments and is therefore going to restrict that movement. Um, the next um, factor we have is going to be contact with soft parts, um, which sounds funny, but it's basically just the point at which one body surface is going to contact another um, to potentially limit uh, mobility. So for example, if you're bending your arm at the elbow, um, and your massive biceps are getting in the way, this is going to be some of the soft parts, if you will, um, that are going to prevent that forearm from bending any, any further um, up against that, the biceps there. Um, so joint movements may also be restricted by the presence of adipose tissue. Um, our fifth factor is going to be hormones. Um, so joint flexibility is often going to be impacted by hormones. So for example, things like relaxin, this is a, a hormone that's going to be produced by the placenta and the ovaries, um, and it's produced during pregnancy especially. Um, and this is going to help to increase the flexibility of the, um, of the fibrocartilage at the pubic symphysis. And this is going to help to loosen the ligaments between um, that are found all around the hips um, at the end of pregnancy. So this is going to help to allow for expansion of that pelvic outlet so that baby is able to have a slightly easier time of making an exit um, from, from the body there. Um, so, yeah. And then last but not least, we have disuse. So movement of a joint may be restricted if a joint has not been used for an extended period of time. So if you ever break your arm and you have your arm in a cast, um, like that covers your elbow, once that cast comes off, there might be some stiffness in that joint that's going to impact the, the range of motion that that elbow joint is going to be able to achieve. Um, so disuse may also result in a de decreased amount of synovial fluid as well as decreased um, flexibility of ligaments and tendons, plus mus muscle atrophy, as well as a reduction um, plus muscle atrophy. And this atrophy is just basically a reduction in size or a wasting away of that muscle. Um, so if you've ever had a cast on your arm, you're probably familiar with this whole disuse issue. Uh, so that is, that is all that we have to discuss um, for chapter nine. Um, like I said, this is going to be important for both the lecture exam three and the lab exam two. So do make sure you pay close attention and know the different types of joints and pay special attention to the types of movements that we've just discussed. All right, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please do feel free to email me. Um, see you in class.